This is a strange board. It's built with RISC-V architecture. RISC architecture is gonna change everything. Yeah, RISC is good. Yes, I know ARM is also RISC architecture, but the chip that powers this thing is built on an open ISA model that's cheaper for companies to use than something with an ARM or x86 chip. But RISC-V is still slow, like decade-old computer slow. And the board has tons of features, like a 20 tops NPU for AI, and an imagination GPU for video acceleration, and a full 40-pin GPIO header like a Raspberry Pi. Except some of those things aren't supported yet. The hardware's there, but the software, not as much. Then there's the form factor. This is mini DTX. And no, I'm not mispronouncing ITX. This edge over here sticks out 33 millimeters further than a standard ITX board, so it won't fit into some smaller cases. It does fit into this fancy custom case Eswin built for the board, so there's that. But even though this is barely faster than a Pi 3B+, Plus, which I can still buy new for 35 bucks, the P550 costs 400. This is not a board I think most of you watching this will buy, but it's very much a board I think you should be interested in. Why? Because it's the fastest dev board for RISC-V on the market today. It's more than twice as fast as the first RISC-V SPC I tested, the Vision 5.2. And the new framework RISC-V main board? Yeah, twice as fast as that too. And it's even faster than the Jupyter board I tested last year, even though it had double the CPU cores. So even with that, the P550's not fast, but it's at least not painfully slow like those older boards. Well, I should qualify that. It's not painfully slow when you're not emulating old AAA games on it. But besides that, it fits in most standard PC cases, it has a full-size PCIe slot, and it has enough bandwidth and I.O. to do just about anything a normal computer does. Just a lot slower. Like, a lot, lot slower. Like, take AI. I ran Llama on my Raspberry Pi 5, and it's slow but not horrible, giving me answers around 5 tokens per second. On here, 0.24 tokens per second, at least on the CPU. There's a way you can get at the on-chip NPU to accelerate it a little more, but right now that's not working out of the box. And the efficiency's pretty bad too. My trusty high-performance Linpack benchmark gives me almost 3 gigaflops per watt on the Pi 5, but on here, 0.8. Ouch. It is the most efficient RISC-V board I've tested, but that's a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. Despite the speed, or lack thereof, I've had a blast testing this thing. The main reason is software support for RISC-V is getting better. ARM had growing pains for years, but it seems like RISC-V is riding ARM's coattails and already has native builds for practically all the things I test day to day. I mean, you're not going to run Zoom or play Netflix on here yet, but the big thing is most developer tools just work. No patches or compiling required. And that's a little sad, because you know how much I love compiling Linux. Speaking of Linux, the kernel that runs on this thing only has around 100 patches over mainline Linux. That may sound like a lot, but other RISC-V boards are stuck on older kernels because they're maintaining hundreds of patches that all need updating. RISC-V might skip the awkward teenage years ARM's going through, where every single SBC requires hacky Linux kernels with minimal vendor support, and I'm here for it. But getting back to the hardware, if you want a complete overview of this thing, go watch Explaining Computers video. It goes over every feature in detail, so it would be silly for me to do the same thing here. Plus, I don't want to deprive you of an exciting Explaining Computers unboxing experience. In this video, I'm going to run through my own testing and see how wild we can get while getting risky. See what I did there? Nice. Very nice. The default setup inside this custom case was a bit loud. The Flex ATX power supply isn't quiet, and the main fan on the heatsink is also pretty loud since it was running at full speed by default. After it booted up though, and despite the noise, I was pretty pleased. I could install Ansible without having to compile any extra Python dependencies. In the past, I had to compile the Python cryptography library, but it looks like that has a native RISC-V build. Olama didn't install right away, but I could at least compile it without much hassle. But while I was doing all this, I was a little puzzled by the board's power consumption. At idle, the board was pulling like 12 to 13 watts, and it only went up to like 14 watts under load. Now, that was using the internal ATX power supply, which is probably not the ideal power source for a low-power SBC. But even after I switched to a 12-volt power adapter and skipped the PSU, it was still burning 8 watts at idle, which is still pretty high. And it looks like the chip is set to run at 1.4 GHz no matter what, and there's no idle power governor that slows down the chip when it doesn't need to go full blast. That can give some power savings, and maybe that'll be added in firmware later, but we'll see. 
To add to my first time user confusion, the heatsink fan at full blast kept the SOC running at like 40 degrees Celsius under load, so there's no reason for it to be running so fast. I was eventually able to ramp down the fan speeds and it never went past 50 degrees, so I hope they add automatic fan control soon. But I also tested out a few general computing things, like watching YouTube. And it wasn't horrible, but let's just say this thing won't be your daily driver unless you like pain and watching videos in potato quality. I mean, if you forced me to run this thing as my desktop, I could get a little work done, and I couldn't say the same thing for the Vision 5 too. But in my testing, I found that while a lot of things do run now, they run poorly. As Chips and Cheese pointed out, most software is optimized for x86 and ARM, but not at all for RISC-V's special extensions. But even there, some of the hardware on this board feels ambitious. Like, it has LPDDR5 RAM that could get like 40 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, but in my testing, I only see like 10. Apparently the P550 cores just don't have the capacity to use all the memory bandwidth, and it doesn't help that these early boards are running at 1.4 gigahertz. Swin support did mention their Debian OS version runs at 1.8 gigahertz now, and it also has extensions to use their NPU, but I haven't been able to test that yet. Everything you see here was running their latest Ubuntu image. And just to be complete on the OS front, I don't want to leave out Fedora. There's already an official Fedora 41 image in testing. But the main thing I wanted to test on this board was PCI Express support. If you subscribe to this channel, you know how much I use and abuse that interface. And at first, I thought they had two PCIe slots on here, a full-size by 16 slot and a mini M.2 slot. But the second slot, if you look closely, says SDIO Wi-Fi module. What's SDIO? Well, I know what it's not. It's not PCI Express. I asked if there were any Wi-Fi cards I could use to test it, and Eswin support said they're working on one. But switching tracks back to the by 16 slot, it's actually only connected to four lanes of PCIe Gen 3, so the absolute maximum speed you can get through there is 32 gigatransfers per second, or about 8 gigabytes per second. But as we'll see in a moment, this chip just can't hit anywhere near that. First, I tried installing an NVMe SSD using the only adapter I had available, which unfortunately was a by one adapter, meaning I only got one lane of bandwidth and not four. With that, at PCIe Gen 3, I could get about 600 megabytes per second. Not too bad. But after I bought this by four adapter and installed it, I only got like 800 megabytes per second. That's a far cry from the two gigabytes per second I'd expect out of a fast NVMe SSD like this one. But it is better than nothing. Switching gears, I thought I'd test out some AMD GPUs. I heard the RISC-V community was hard at work enabling at least some GPUs using AMD's open source drivers. And they worked. I tested out this ancient R5 230, which is nice because it's a half-height single slot card and it fits perfectly inside this case. Initially though, I did have some issues, like I couldn't get OpenGL working. But then after updating the OS, I was able to get OpenGL working on both the internal Imagination GPU as well as the AMD R5. And I tried running Super Tux card, but it failed the first time I tried it. I found out I had to set a special backend for OpenGL to work. And also I couldn't just swap my monitor between the iGPU and the graphics card. I had to change a file and reboot each time. The other limitation, and it's the same thing on ARM, is you can't see any early boot screens if you're using a graphics card. The U-boot screens only show up if you're plugged into the built-in HDMI port. Anyway, with all those bugs ironed out, it was time to get risky. And by that I mean installing this RX 480 in a very precarious manner on top of the case with a riser cable. I mean, if it works, it works. And I'm happy to report it ran Super Tux Cart at a snappy 50 FPS. The iGPU on the same settings only gets about 10 to 15, so at least native Linux apps can fully utilize the graphics card. What about AAA Windows games? Well, let's not set our sights too high. What about AAA Windows games from a decade ago? I heard T Seb had gotten The Witcher 3 running on Risk V, though he was testing on a Pioneer board with 16 times more CPU cores than I had here. But I wanted to see if the P550 would run it at all. The problem is, getting all the dependencies lined up to translate Windows system calls into Linux, then x86 calls to Risk V, and finally DirectX to Vulkan was a bit messy. And I have a whole blog post with instructions if you want to try it out, but here's a summary. First, I compiled Box64 along with RISC-V and 32-bit extensions. Then, to install The Witcher, I would normally use Steam, but so far nobody's been able to get Steam to run on RISC-V. So instead, I manually installed Wine, which is not an emulator, and I installed the game directly from GOG.com. And that took a really long time. I, I think it was about seven hours. 
We are an hour in on this, and uh, it's still installing. I'm half wondering if it's using most of the CPU just to change these little ads during the installation. But you can see, it's uh, one hour of progress. The bar has only gotten to that point. The whole time it was installing, it was only using one CPU core, and it was copying over like 40 gigabytes of data, so I guess that's to be expected on this thing. Well, we're a day later, and I had to plug in a different keyboard and mouse because the one I was using is not working with this anymore. After I installed it, I tried launching it and ran into some errors. Apparently, I was missing DXVK, a tool to translate Windows graphics calls into Vulkan, a language the Linux drivers can work with. So, after doing all that, it finally launches. And, well, sometimes you talk about frames per second. This isn't quite seconds per frame, at least most of the time, but it took me a couple hours just to get through the first room. And because the controls are so touchy when you're playing in PowerPoint slideshow mode, I didn't have the patience to go find clothes, so I played the first level shirtless. Not me, the Witcher guy. But I got between 0 to 2 FPS, and if I held down escape for like 10 seconds, I could get back to the menu where I got a snappy 4 FPS. It wasn't playable, but it worked, which is huge, because that means through all the translated layers of code, this processor is able to coordinate everything to render pixels on the screen. That can be the most challenging part sometimes, and that means as RISC-V gets faster, the experience will only get better, at least with old AAA games. I monitored CPU and GPU usage the whole time, and the game was definitely CPU bound. All four cores pegged barely managed 2 FPS. Measuring GPU performance and Radeon Top, it looks like it was barely doing anything. I mean, there was only one time while playing the game I even saw the card's fan spin up. I also tried monitoring the GPU with NVTOP, but that just gave me a segmentation fault, so not everything is RISC-V compatible. But before giving up on modern games, I also tried out a simpler game that still used 3D rendering, World of Goo. It took a brisk hour to install, and launching it took less than a minute, which <laughs> these things were welcome improvements over The Witcher. But even though the game is a lot simpler, it was still CPU bound and couldn't quite hit a smooth frame rate. At least it was still playable. And I remind you, this is the Windows version. Apparently there's also a Linux version available, and that would probably run a little bit smoother. But games are just a fun thing to try. Nobody's seriously going to try gaming on this board. What some people could use it for is LLMs, or AI chatbots. As long as you can fit the working data into a GPU's VRAM, it won't rely on the pokey CPU cores. And after all, there's a 20 tops NPU on the chip. How do you use it? Well, I don't know yet. So far, its Linux drivers are pretty bleeding edge, and I haven't gotten any LLMs running on it. Failing that, you could run things on the CPU, but like I said earlier, that's 20 times slower than a Pi 5, so it's not really worth it. But luckily, since I can use an AMD GPU, we can get Vulkan acceleration. And with that, I got between 15 to 30 tokens per second on Llama 3.2 3B and a few more tokens on an RX 580. These older GPUs are only like 40 to 50 bucks, so if you wanted to try out some small AI models on RISC-V, I mean, there are worse ways to do that. This setup did burn about 100 watts of power, so again, for AI, at least until that NPU works, it's not that efficient. Now, I did briefly try a newer AMD GPU, but I had some trouble. I got this kernel oops message. Supposedly there are patches that'll fix that, or I could switch to S1's Bleeding Edge Debian release, but honestly, the little PSU inside this thing was probably already sweating once I adapted the 8-pin CPU connector to dual 8-pin PCI for the 6700 XT. After all that testing, I'm confident saying this board isn't going to sell in the millions. Probably not even in the high thousands. It's made for developers who want to build stuff for RISC-V and want a well-supported hardware platform. So far, it's the fastest and most efficient RISC-V board I've tested. It has tons of standard interfaces to work with, and as a bonus, it fits inside a PC case. Would I recommend you go buy one of these? No. But does it excite me seeing RISC-V hardware compatibility already closing the gap with ARM? Yes. It'd be great to see three thriving ecosystems with software supporting them all because the AMD and Intel duopoly was doing the industry no favors, and with ARM's licensing shenanigans, it'd be great to have another player in the low end. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.